So my name is Emily Glinkler. Uh, I am an AP World History teacher in Austin, Texas. I uh, have been teaching AP World for, I don't know, six, seven years. I've taught it and the test seems to change every single year. So I am totally ready for this whole new coronavirus edition of the 2020 um, AP exam. Uh, in addition to teaching WAP in Austin, I also have a podcast called Anti-Social Studies that covers history. I also provide a lot of resources online on my website. So I'm going to show that to you all in a second. Um, if you are looking for some more like practice DBQs, some more review resources, that's all stuff that uh, you can find there. So just making sure everything seems to be working. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to walk you through a few things. Here we go. All right. So hopefully you are seeing my screen right now. Um, it's showing you right now the AP World History Modern Course Exam and Description. Uh, and I will, we can post the links to that in the chat towards the end. This has a lot of really good information, especially for students who are wondering kind of what they should be studying. But for today, my plan is that I'm just going to write a DBQ live. Ooh, we're going to see how this goes. Uh, it's either going to be really helpful or really embarrassing or probably a mix of both. Um, but before I get to that, I want to mention a few things about who I am and kind of why I'm doing this today. So I'm doing this today because on my Instagram, a bunch of people asked me to do this. So I hope y'all are there because it's your fault that I am forcing myself to write an essay live on YouTube. Uh, so if you don't already, go check out my Instagram at Anti-Social Studies. That is where I'm getting feedback from students and teachers about what y'all want to see. So a few days ago, I posted on my stories a question of, you know, what do you want me to do during this live? And a bunch of people asked me to just write a DBQ and show them how I would do it. So I'm going to be going live on the Marco Learning YouTube channel every Saturday for the next few Saturdays. So I will be looking for more feedback and more ideas of what you think would be helpful for me to do in these 45 minutes. So this is the best place to kind of give your feedback, ask questions, all that good stuff is on my Instagram. The other place that you might want to go look is my website, antisocialstudies.org. Um, if you go to WAP resources, there's a whole page all about the AP exam and everything's been updated for the new coronavirus edition of the exam. Um, for example, I have some practice DBQs that are new kind of five document DBQs. I have other review materials that you can use as students or teachers. So check those two things out um, and I hope that you'll find them helpful. The last thing I want to say is that I also have my own YouTube channel, Anti-Social Studies. And so uh, there, what I've been doing is posting much shorter videos, walking through the new rubric step by step. So I have like a 10 or 15 minute video all about the thesis statement. And then I have a 10 or 15 minute video all about what it means to evaluate the documents, that sort of thing. So um, if you are really like, especially as I'm writing my essay today and you're like, I still don't really understand what outside evidence is, um, make sure to go uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel because I'm posting those videos. I'll be posting all of them up through the next week or so. Okay, so with that, uh, I think that we need to just start writing this DBQ. Oh my gosh, I haven't been a student in a really long time. So this is gonna be really interesting. So full disclosure, right? I made this prompt. So like I have seen these documents before, right? I, I chose them, but I will say I had never seen any of these documents before I like dug them up for this DBQ. And I have not done any outlining or anything like that. I wanna try to show you live um, how I would work through a DBQ, how I would skim the documents. Before we get to the prompt, I wanna show you the worksheet that I'm gonna be working off of. This is just in a Google doc. I have posted this on my website to where you can make a copy of it if you think that this looks like a useful tool for you. The point is on this test, since we're gonna be taking it online, and I highly recommend if you can that you take it on a computer or a laptop, um, you can have other applications open to help you. And so actually what the College Board has recommended is that you type your essay somewhere else. You type your essay in a Google Doc, in a Word document, whatever, then you can either upload or you can just copy and paste the text over into the AP exam application when it's time to upload. Um, because we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, what the app is gonna look like that they're gonna ask you to upload your essay, but like it's probably not gonna be as functional as Google Docs or Word. So I would suggest that over these next few weeks, hopefully you're doing some practice DBQs. And as you do, I would highly suggest that you practice the way you're gonna test. So start thinking about, do I wanna kind of hand write my notes? Um, is that more natural to me? And then I go type my essay, or do you wanna use something like this? So what I've done here is I basically just made myself a simplified rubric to remind myself of the things I need to do. 
Um, and I've, I've kind of color coded them, right? So the green are for me personally, what I see as kind of the easiest points for me to get. The yellow are like, cool, if I have time, I'm gonna try to do as many of these as possible. And the red are the ones that I'm like, oh, unless I'm just bored and sitting there for the last 10 minutes, which will not happen. I'm just going to kind of ignore these and not worry about them. The big idea is that you want to have a strategy for you. You do not need to get 10 points out of 10 points to do well on this AP exam. Um, so if you're shooting for anywhere between like six, seven, eight, nine points, that's great. So what I would be thinking about is what is your strategy? What are the maybe six, five or six points that you find the easiest to get? then think through what are another two or three points that like, if I have time, I feel pretty good that I could go back and add those in. Um, so I'll be kind of referencing this as I'm writing my DBQ today. And so you'll kind of see how I'm gonna use this to work. The other thing that I have on this document is a place to type out the prompt um, to force yourself to actually read every word of the prompt. And then obviously a place to kind of just jot down quick notes about each document as I look at them. So you can figure out what works for you. This is just sort of what I came up with and what I would probably use if I were taking the AP test online. Um, but again, you can handwrite like wh whatever makes you feel the most comfortable. The last thing I'll say before I get started is that I would recommend if it's possible that you get two screens. Now it's not a big deal if you can't, I'm doing all of this on one screen today, but especially if you're gonna be typing up your notes like this, it can be really, really nice to have like the thing with the documents on one screen and then this on another, so you don't have to keep clicking back and forth. Again, it's not really a big deal, but if that's something that's already exists in your house, if your parents have an office set up that already has two screens or whatever, I would suggest that you like kick them out of their office for the 45 minutes of the AP exam. Okay, I'm just stalling. I just really don't wanna write this essay, but we're gonna do it and it's gonna be fun. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the prompt that I made. And this prompt is up on my website, antisocialstudies.org. So if you wanna then look at this later and go in more depth on the documents, it is here for you. Okay, so the first thing I do is I read the prompt and then I turn around. I'm gonna see if this is gonna let me copy and paste. And I'm gonna copy it into my, oh, it does. And I'm gonna copy it over into my document so that it is like with me at all times. I am constantly remembering, I might make it obnoxiously big, right? I am constantly remembering what the question is asking me. So now I have to read through the prompt. Evaluate the extent to which, man, they love those questions the state promoted educational institutions in the 19th century. Okay, <laughs> I've actually never really thought about this. You would think that having made this DBQ, I would have really thought about my answer, but I actually haven't, which is gonna be fun to watch. So what the first thing that you wanna do is you wanna pick out the key terms of the prompt. The way you would think about this is let's say you wanted to find this document online, um, what would you Google, right? You would Google like DBQ and then you would Google like state, uh, educational institutions and 19th century. Those are kind of the keywords. Um, now the date is, is always gonna be a keyword, right? You wanna make sure that you're staying within the parameters of the prompt. So if this had said in Afro-Eurasia, I would bold that as well to remind myself, like I need to just be talking about Afro-Eurasia and I need to just be talking about the 1800s. But really um, the, the two keywords here are state and educational institutions. And the reason why it's important to identify these is that this is then gonna help you skim the documents. So as I go through and skim these five documents, what I'm looking for are words or phrases related to the state. So government, leader, ruler, law, anything like that. And keywords related to educational institutions, schools, students, university, blah, blah, blah. That's gonna help you if you kind of identify those keywords off the bat, then it keeps you from having to read every single word of the document. Once you, when you come across a keyword or something related to the keyword, then you stop and you read that part in a lot of detail. Okay, so let's just do it. So we're gonna try to evaluate the extent to which the state promoted educational institutions in the 19th century. Basically an evaluate the extent to which question means there's a spectrum on one end of the spectrum is like 100%. So every state everywhere promoted educational institutions. The other end of the spectrum is never, no state ever promoted educational institutions. And where we're probably gonna land is like somewhere in the middle, but the evaluate the extent to which question basically just means you're gonna place yourself on that spectrum. For the most part states did, for the most part states didn't, or some states did for this reason and other states did for this reason, which is probably the best way to go. Typically, if the AP exam is giving you a prompt like this, they're telling you that 
the state promoted educational institutions, they're just now asking you to describe or explain how and why and like in what way did they do it. All right, stop procrastinating and delaying, Emily, we can do this. So let's skim through the first document. So what we're looking for here is we need to first read in full the um, source material, right? We cannot skim that. In the same way that we should not skim the prompt, we shouldn't skim the source material. So this is from Yan Fu Li. I don't know who that is, but that's okay. An exchange student, beautiful. Already we know this document is related to education. He's in a fellowship program in the United States um, and it's called When I Went to School in China. Okay, beautiful. So what we're looking for here is we've already identified that this document is mostly related to education, one of our two key terms. So really the whole document is going to be about school because it's called when I went to school in China. But what I'm now looking for are keywords that relate to our other thing, the state, right? I'm now looking for and I'm going to skim until I see something that is, is any way related to political systems or the state. All right, so schools are generally kept by private, privates like the opposite of the state, the government, oh, there we go, already. So I need to read this in depth. The government provides for advanced scholars only. Okay, so this is sort of limited is what I'm seeing. But since the one qualification for office, oh, this is all about the state, is education and the avenue is to literary distinction and public honors, public is related to the state, lies through competitive exams. The encouragement that the government extends to education and learning can be estimated only by that eager pursuit of knowledge, which is common to all classes, by the veneration in which they're held. Blah, blah. Okay, so this is basically saying everyone wants to get a good education in China because it's the way to get to work in the government, which is like a really prominent and an honorable job. But the government doesn't actually provide a lot of those educational opportunities, but they provide the incentive by giving people jobs who pass those exams. Okay, so now I'm just gonna skim. It's not strange that schools are found everywhere. Okay, so everyone wants an education. Oh, here we go. Although the government appropriates no funds for the establishment of common schools. Cool, thanks, Qing Dynasty. Um, there's no such thing as compulsory education. Basically, everyone still wants to get it. Okay, so that's document one. So what I'm gonna go back here and I'm just gonna type some sort of keywords uh, where I'm gonna say like China, right? Um, education or everyone wants education, government jobs, Government doesn't provide many educational opportunities. Okay, cool. So now I've skimmed through document one. Now I'm gonna go down to document two. And again, I need to read the source material in a lot of detail. Um, so let's get my drawing tool back out. And I don't know, I don't think you're gonna be able to annotate the documents when you, we don't know exactly if you're gonna be able to annotate them on the actual AP exam, but um, that's why like having some other sort of note-taking strategy is probably good. Um, okay, this is from Thomas Bevington Macaulay, Speech in Parliament on the Government of India Bill in 1833. Okay, so this guy's probably British, but who knows. Um, Government of India Bill, and it's in 1833. So this again is mostly, this is like a state document. So now I'm looking for when they're talking about education. And hey, the first word is education, so awesome. So he's basically talking about on education and the English Empire in India. I feel that for the good of India, the admissions of natives to high office must be affected by slow degrees. Okay, so he's actually saying like Indian people should be allowed to work in the government, but that doesn't have to do with education yet. To the great trading nation, the great manufacturing. Oh, I see knowledge. Okay, so I'm skimming. So now I need to, I need to go back and read this sentence. No progress which any portion of the human race can make in knowledge and taste for convenience as wealth can be a matter of indifference. So you're basically saying knowledge is important. Okay, cool. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, it is scarcely possible to calculate the benefits which we might derive from the diffusion of European civilization. Yeah, okay, cult, you know, cultural superiority, civilizing mission. It would be selfish. It would be far better for us that the people of India were well governed and independent. Oh, that's weird. Than ill governed and subject to us. They were ruled by their own kings, but wearing our broadcloth, our stuff, using our stuff. Um, Let's see, but we're too ignorant. Okay, here's another word about education. Um, so we don't want them to be too ignorant to value or too poor to buy English stuff. Okay, interesting. Are we to keep the people of India ignorant in order that we may keep them submissive? So that has to do with, right, he's a state figure and he's talking about ignorance, meaning the lack of education. Do we think that we can give them knowledge without awakening ambition? The path of duty is plain before us, and it is also the path of wisdom, of national prosperity, of national honor. 
This is kind of a weird document. If I'm being honest, if I were actually just taking the AP test, I might just skip this one <laughs> because it's like taking me a second to figure out what exactly he's saying because I'm expecting him as a British guy to be like, we need to dominate India, but it seems like he's actually saying the opposite. So that's one quick tip, right? I'm going to go through all five documents, but you don't need to, right? To get the vast majority of points, you really only need to address two, which means you're going to address three. And so if you're going through and you're looking at this and your brain is kind of melting, like what is he talking about? Then just skip it and move on. So I want to be able to show you how to do this. So I'm going to force myself to do all five documents, but honestly, I would normally just skip this one. So he's basically saying we should prefer to have India be independent, but be like intelligent and have money so that they can trade with us and buy our stuff. So, okay. So that's interesting. That's kind of not at all what I was expecting that document to say. Again, I made this DBQ a while back, so I kind of forgot. So it's, it's talking about England and India. Um, Britain should want Indians to be educated because that makes them wealthy and smart to buy British stuff. Okay, beautiful. Let's just move on. I don't like that document. Uh, document three is an image. Oh, thank God. Okay, so document three is a commemorative postcard of the Japanese Ministry of Education circa, this is supposed to say 1890. Um, okay, so it is showing the Japanese Ministry of Education. I don't really get much else from it. It's just that like this is in Tokyo and it's a postcard. Like who's buying a postcard of the education building? Um, okay, we might want to think about the intended audience in a little bit, but so what we really just get from here is the Japanese are really proud of their education department because they're putting its building on a postcard. All right, that was easy. Good. I needed a break after Thomas Babington. So we see the Japanese proud of Department of Education. Uh, another thing, like if you're shown, you know, a piece of architecture is you might want to just look if there's anything else we can gather. Like to me, this looks a lot more like a more Western building. This doesn't to me look very traditionally Japanese. So I might add that in um, kind of a Western style building. Right. And that might give us some insight into maybe what their education system is like. All right. Document four is from Mrs. Alfred Sidgwick. Ooh, a lady. We don't get these a lot. Uh, she's a British writer and traveler talking about student life at the German universities. Okay, so again, the document, the main part of the document is about education. So we are now looking for keywords that relate to the other, the other part of the prompt, which is the state, right? This is a way to skim through this quickly. Small university towns, there are a lot. Students are part of the social life. But in Berlin, the beer person is lost. That's fun. I'm going to highlight that, that just because I think that's fun. Um, in Berlin, if you go to university, you see a lot of serious people. They're carrying books. They're going to lectures. Basically, they're not fun is what she's saying. They, um, I'm not seeing anything about the state yet. They have worked hard for 12 years. Nothing about the state. They are the men of, here we go. It's like in the last sentence. They are the men of next year's Germany and will carry on their country's reputation in the world for efficiency and scholarship. This is what I mean, like why I wanted to show you how to skim. Because like, I feel like a lot of people like me would get really caught up in who a beer person was. <laughs> but like, none of this is really that helpful. It's just saying students in Berlin are super serious. And it's not until the last sentence that it tells you why and what, what that has to do with the state. Because they are the ones responsible. They're going to become the leaders, the next leaders of Germany. Um, and that is really important in the German nation. Okay. So Berlin, education, important future leaders of government. Awesome. Now let's go to our last document. So document five is about the missionary travels and researches in South Africa by David Livingston. I know who that is. He was like an explorer and a missionary. He's describing the language of the Betuana tribe of South Africa. So I'm not actually sure whether this document is primarily about the state or education. So I'm just going to kind of skim and see if I can figure it out. So he says, it is fortunate that the translation of the Bible, translation has to do with education, has been affected before the language became adulterated with half uttered foreign words. Well, those who have heard the eloquence of the natives assemblies, so they're very eloquent, the natives, that might mean they're educated. The young who are brought up in, ah, uh, here we go, who are brought up in our schools, so there are British schools amongst this tribe, they know less of the language than the missionaries. So they're not learning their native language, the students that are in British schools. Um, okay, and Europeans born in the country, while possessed of the idiom perfectly, if not otherwise educated, cannot be referred to for explanation of any uncommon word. So basically no one's learning this language, even the natives and the Europeans living there. 
a person who acted as an interpreter, the language of the Basutos was not capable of expressing the substance of a diplomatic paper. Okay, that's, that's government, right? The British are sort of looking down on this language as less advanced. Um, let's see. Oh, but then this is saying, but everyone who really knows this chief knows that he could in his own tongue have expressed it without study all over again in three or four different ways. The interpreter could scarcely have done as much in English. Oh, this is a really cool document. So basically what this is saying is younger people in these tribes are being brought up in British schools and they're not learning their native language. And it seems like because there's this idea that their language is less advanced or is uncivilized, but David Livingston is saying that's actually not true. It's actually like a really advanced language and we're just sort of being culturally ignorant. Huh, okay. So we're see, we get a few things from that. We see British schools in African colonies and we see the loss of traditional language culture in those schools. Um, colonial government is discriminating. Okay, so now I have my five documents. You notice I haven't worried about HIP yet, like evaluating the documents. I just wanna get through the basic parts of my essay first. So now I'm going back and I'm thinking about the prompt. I'm evaluating the extent to which states promoted educational institution. Well, in all of these, they did to some extent. So in all of them, they're on that yes end of the spectrum, but some did less than others. And, and it seems like they did for different reasons. So what I'm noticing is I'm noticing that some of the documents are related to like national pride, um, something like uh, maybe social mobility, having a role in the government. That seems to be a theme. And we see that in the document about China. And we also see that in the document about Germany. Um, and let's see, then we also are seeing some about economics, right? Like there's an economic benefit to having, you know, education. And that could be India, definitely. They're saying we want them, we'd rather they be educated and independent so they can trade with us than uneducated and subservient to us. I think you could bring in the British schools and the African colonies to connect those two together because it's both British schools in, in colonial holdings. And then what to do with the Japan one, right? The pictures are normally the weirdest one. So in the Japan one, I would think that we would have Let's see, well, they're proud of their Department of Education, so that might be national pride, right? I'm, I'm just gonna throw that there. Okay, so there we go. This is my basic organization. Now, what I want you to notice about my strategy is that I'm gonna try to get all these basic points first. So I'm, going, I'm trying to get all the green points first, get my basic structure of an essay down. Then when I see how much time I have left, I'll go back and add other things in. So let's just do this super quickly. So really what I'm gonna do at first is my intro is just gonna be my, my prompt or my thesis statement. So let's start writing. So I would say um, in the 19th century, uh, states did promote educational institutions. Some used education as a source of national pride and social mobility, while others saw economic opportunity in uneducated population. Sure, okay, that makes sense. That's specific enough where someone reading that could understand what my essay is gonna be about, but I haven't really gone into the specifics of the document yet. So now that's that's all I'm doing for my intro right now is those two sentences. So now I'm just gonna do my first paragraph. So I'm kind of just gonna copy my thesis again. Some states used education to promote national pride often by providing opportunities for social mobility and a role in the government. That's my topic sentence. And now I just need to talk about the documents. So I'm gonna talk about, I'll just do them in order, talk about document one first. So document one is about, right, school in China. So in China, even though the government didn't provide many state-run schools, um, Chinese people, still were motivated to build and attend schools on their own. And I got that from document one. So notice like, I'm not quoting from the document. I don't need to say like Yan Fu Li says in document one, I'm just like pulling out what I got from that. That's evidence for the topic sentence that I just made. That's it, right? You don't have to describe it in detail. You just have to like use enough of it specifically as evidence to prove to the grader that you read it and you understand, understand what document one is about. Um, 
this so but I still haven't really talked a, about the connection between the state I'm basically saying the state didn't actually provide a lot of education um, however so however the state did provide an incentive to get educated there we go so now I've kind of made the connection between the two because people who passed the exams got prestigious prestigious uh, jobs in the government Okay, I've now addressed that document. I'm going to move on. If I if I have time, I'm going to come back and maybe flush this out. But I have at least addressed the document and I've used it to clearly support my argument. So that's good. Now I'm just going to move on to the next one I had, which is document four. Uh, Berlin, right? The non-beer people. Okay. Uh, similarly, that's the AP exam really likes that. Um, young college students in Berlin saw education as a way to become the next leaders of Germany. Document four. Again, that's that's it. I've now addressed the document. I have something specific. I don't know why I put an apostrophe in there. Um, they felt a sense of purpose and were motivated to be serious in their studies, not beer people, <laughs> because they were seen as the future of the this new country. Cool, okay. So really it's like, I just kind of want to try to put at least two sentences together. One where I'm just sort of extracting the evidence from the document. So like, okay, the document four was telling me that college students kind of took college seriously because they could then become leaders of the state. And then I normally want to add at least one more sentence in where I really clearly kind of say the same thing in a new way, where I really clearly make the connection between the two keywords, between the state and the education, right? Um, okay. And now my weird one, document three, the Japanese building. Um, other young states, cool, right? I'm drawing a connection between Germany and Japan. They're both kind of newer states in the 1800s, at least unified Germany and Meiji Japan. So that's cool. And I'll come back to that because that could be like a little tidbit of complexity that we can maybe flesh out if we have time. Other young states um, felt pride in their government run education systems. In Japan, they were so proud of their Department of Education that they, I don't know, created postcards <laughs> for visitors to take with them um, and highlight the Japanese education system. Well, that's not great, but that's fine. I think that'll probably get me the point. That's why like you want to always do one more than you have to. So like if you're trying to do all four documents, then you really want to do five because that one's like a little weird. I'm not really sure if I got that about the postcards. I think I did, but um, that's the way to be safe. I want to pause here because I want to point something out, right? To get nine out of the 10 rubric points, you actually like, I, I could stop here in terms of using the documents. I've actually, I've used three, right? So if we go up here and remember, right? Like I've actually already done the thesis. I've already addressed two documents and I've already used two documents to support an argument. I'm already at a three. So for the purposes of um, this, I don't actually have to go on and use the other two documents to get this last point. Um, for us, because I wanna show you a complete essay, I'm gonna do that. But I wanna mention for y'all that like, you could kind of stop here and now go back and start adding in outside evidence, evaluating the document, especially if you're looking at the time, right? I started at around 310, there's 330. So I'm like halfway through now, I'm around 20 minutes in. So this is when you do want to stop and take stock, right? You should probably set a timer or something like that to say like around 20 minutes in pause and be like, where am I at? Like, I got to get going, right? So if I were actually doing this on the AP test, I might stop here for, for a second and go in and add like some of these points back in before I tried to get this one, right? Because you can, by adding in outside evidence and evaluating the documents, that's like four potential points as opposed to just one for me going and talking about the other two documents. For now, for the purposes of like learning how to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and do my second paragraph, but like if I were on the test, I wouldn't. So my second paragraph, I'm just gonna kind of copy from my thesis. Other states, saw education as important for the economic success of their country. 
Okay, now I'm gonna go and use my other two documents, England, India, okay. Uh, for example, some British politicians were willing to give up control of India if that meant that their population would be educated and wealthy enough to trade with the British. Uh, and that's from document two. Uh, yeah, so um, in this case, state power um, through imperialism was less important than economic power. And the British believed that their economy would be stronger if they were trading with educated countries. Okay, so again, I've kind of done my two sentences. In some ways, I'm saying the same thing twice, but I'm saying them in different ways to make sure that the reader is like, cool, I really see that connection. They might, after that first sentence, that might be enough, but I'm gonna add one more in just to make sure it's really clear that I'm, I'm understanding the role between the state and the education. Um, lastly, we have, again, British colonial schools. Okay, so I can have a nice little transition here where I can say um, in other British colonies, like South Africa, uh, the British maintained more control over educational institutions. Um, British run schools uh, emphasized British culture and language, meaning that African people, African children, often didn't learn their native language. Document five, I think that is, document five. Um, yeah, okay, and I think I've kind of explained that, but let me just do one more sentence just in case. For the British in Africa, uh, developing a cultural relationship through education was important uh, for the maintenance, does this make sense? I'm not sure, for the maintenance of their colonies. I still haven't done anything about, about economy, which is my whole argument, so here we go. Their colonies, which were important to the British economy. Okay, there we go, I'm like, I'm done. I wanna move on from these documents. So I've done all five, I didn't need to do all five, um, but we kind of see, I want you to see, like you do not have to go into a lot of detail describing the document, you just use it, just use it. Um, make sure you still give at least two sentences where you're like, here's me using the document and here's me really clearly linking that back to my topic sentence. So I really believe that like, you don't have to have any organization in your essay, you could just have it be like one big long document. But I honestly think having it divided into categories and having clear topic sentences helps you so much because the difference between these two points in the rubric, just addressing documents and using them really comes down to your thesis and your topic sentence. So because I had really clear topic sentences here, like they saw education as important for the economic success, success of their country, it was helpful for me to remind myself like, wait, Emily, you still actually haven't connected it back to your topic sentence yet. So I had to add in this little part about the economy. So I just think keeping it organized into maybe like two body paragraphs and having clear topic sentences, that just helps guide you, right? So you notice that like my first sentence is typically kind of addressing the document, just like here's what the document showed that's relevant for my argument. And then I add in a second sentence where I really clearly link what I just said back to this topic sentence right here. Um, and that's just like covering all my bases to make sure that I'm really getting those maximum points for not just like discussing the document, but for really clearly using it to support an argument. Okay, so now I have the basics. Here's what's cool about that. I now have one, two, three, I have four points already. Now for the rest of the time, so we have about 15, 10 or 15 minutes left in our live session. Um, for the rest of the time, I'm just gonna see the rest of this as a menu of options. And whichever ones I think I can do quickly and easily, I'm gonna go and start adding those back into my essay. So I think outside evidence in an open note, open book test is kind of a slam dunk. So let's do at least one piece of outside evidence. So let's think about 
either a state using education to promote national pride or social mobility, or a state using education as important for ec the economic success of their country. Um, well, I know a lot of stuff about Japan. I've already talked about Japan a little bit, but for example, like here, I've just sort of addressed the literal building and the literal postcard, which is what document three was. But I do also know that in the Meiji restoration in Japan, their education system really emphasized science and it really emphasized reverence for the emperor and Japanese culture, which would relate to this. So I'm gonna to try to use that as outside evidence, but here's the trick. You wanna be careful that it doesn't feel like you're just like adding a little tidbit onto your discussion of document three. You wanna make sure that your outside evidence could stand on its own as a fully separate piece of evidence. So let me show you how I might do that as I think through how I might do that. Um, the Japanese education system after the Meiji Restoration um, was more westernized as seen in the Western style architecture of the Department of Education building. So this is sort of my little transition from like, here's the, doc here's the document, I'm gonna transition to something else. However, even more important, uh, Japanese schools did not adopt all Western ideas in their schools. This doesn't have to be pretty, right? Um, while they did emphasize science and math to better industrialize, um, they also taught Japanese culture and reverence for the emperor. In this way, Meiji schools were important instruments for promoting national pride. Uh, yeah, period. Boom. So what we see here is that even though my piece of outside evidence, right, which is really like here, even though my piece of outside evidence is like related to the document, I hope you see these are two totally separate points. So like if I did not talk about document three at all, and I just said, Japanese schools in the Meiji Restoration, blah, 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 this would still be a good piece of outside evidence. The point is your outside evidence can't just be like, let's say you talk about the Japanese education system and then you just add a little comma and you say, which emphasized reverence for the emperor. That's not enough to be outside evidence. That's now just like a little tidbit that you've added in about something related to document three. So it really needs to be its own fully separate point that could stand on its own. Okay, so I've gone in and I've done one piece of outside evidence. I think I could do more, but for the purposes of showing y'all, I'm gonna evaluate one of the documents. So I'm like really fascinated by that freaking postcard. So um, let me think about this, but I don't wanna, let me talk about a different document. So the other thing I'm really interested in is in document two, let me go back and make sure I'm right on this, on the date. Yeah, the date's 1833. And I happen to know that the Sepoy Rebellion happened in 1857. Now, if you were on the AP test and you don't know that for sure, but you're like, I was this before or after the Sepoy Rebellion? Here's one thing you could do on the AP exam. You could go to Google and say, when was the Sepoy Rebellion? And you would see, okay, 1857. So this document is from before that time. So I might talk about the historical situation of this document. And that might be what I evaluate. So let me go find where I talked about document two. Here we go, okay. Here we go. So this is the end of me kind of discussing document two. Uh, they believe their economy would be strong if they were trading with educated countries. This might be because at the time the document was written, the British government actually wasn't in direct control of India. This was still in the Mughal slash British East India Company rule era. <laughs> and so it makes sense that politicians would be okay with having less control in exchange for an educated Indian population because they wouldn't actually be losing any control they don't already have. Does that make sense? Um, so what I'm doing here, right, is I'm, I'm I, again, 
when you're evaluating a document, either let's say, you know, HIP stands for the historical situation, the intended audience, the purpose of the point of view. What you're really trying to do is like explain how one of the one of those things helps us better understand the document. So to me, I was like kind of confused by that document, right? When I was reading it, I was like, that's weird. That wasn't what I was expecting Thomas to say. I was expecting him to say like, India is ours forever, but he didn't. He actually said like, no, no, it's fine if it's not ours, but as long as they are happy with us and they trade with us and they're educated and they want our stuff, then that's fine. And I was a little confused, but now that makes more sense once I go back and look at the historical situation. When I look back and see that that document was you know 25 years before the Sepoy Rebellion. So like to him, to this politician, it's they're not losing anything, right? They already have this informal economic control. Um, and so it makes sense that he's like, yeah, it's fine if we don't ever completely rule India, it's better to just have a good trading relationship with them because that's what they already have. If that document had been written after the Sepoy Rebellion when Britain was in complete charge, that would be a lot more confusing, right? So that's an example of evaluating the document. Let's do one more that's not historical situation. Um, notice that like historical situation is very specific to the document. It's a different point than context. So actually let's do, let's try context, right? So I've evaluated one document. So now I'm up to a one, two, three, four, five, six. Awesome, that's kind of my base where like, I wanna end with at least a six. So let's try context. So context means you are contextualizing the prompt and or you're contextualizing your thesis statement. So my thesis statement, if I go back to that, is that 19th century states are promoting education, they're using it for national pride, and they're using it for economic opportunity. So to me, I mean, the easy things to then contextualize are national pride, I can talk about rising nationalism, and economic opportunity, I can talk about the industrial revolution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my cursor in front of my thesis, and I'm going to add in the context now after the fact. So I might say something like, from the 17th to the 19th centuries, um, many states were developing or no, were industrializing and developing a stronger national identity, especially in the West, um, rising nationalism and the industrial revolution. These are now specific things I'm mentioning led to uh, an imperial competition for resources. Um, by the 19th century, European states and the states that were impacted by European imperialism were beginning to highly value education to promote economic growth and as a point of pride in their country. Okay, and then that leads into my thesis statement. So what I want you to notice is I um, clearly connected it to what I was then gonna argue my thesis. Um, I also mentioned some specifics, rising nationalism, that's a specific term, the industrial revolution. And I want you to also notice that I'm using the C's, right? The AP history classes are centered around the, the three C's which are comparison, causation, and change over time. So what I'm really saying is when I say it led to competition, um, states that were impacted by, that's causation. Um, they were beginning to, that's change over time, right? So what I'm really trying to do is paint this, I'm trying to paint this picture of saying like, how did we get here? How did we get to this time period in the 19th century where states were promoting education? And so you go back and contextualize that prompt. Notice that it's different from contextualizing the document like I just did for the India one. That is like super specific to that document, what's happening in British India in 1833, right? So I have, I'm gonna end at around 350. So I have like five minutes left in my 45 minutes. And now if I've done everything correctly, I now have a seven, which is very exciting. Um, and so what I wanna decide is, should I use my time to go do outside evidence or to do HIP? Um, and for me, I think I have a good idea of another piece of outside evidence. So I'm gonna go do that. So again, I want you noticing my strategy. I got the basics down and now I'm like judging by my time, I'm going back and like inserting points wherever I can find them, which you always were able to do, but it's now so much easier that we're typing. So I feel like I know a little bit about the US education system and it had to do with industrialization. So I'm gonna talk about that. This just is something I happen to know about. So with outside evidence, it's like, 
do what is natural and what you know, but like, you know, don't, you're not notice. I'm not spending any time going back through my book. I don't have time for that. Right. So let's say I want to add, um, similarly in the United States, uh, public education became more prominent in the late 1800s. Activists like Horace Mann, it's just a thing I happen to know, big fan of Horace, uh, activists like Horace Mann pushed for the development of secular public schools to educate all children by the end of the 19th century, many young Americans were in schools. Okay, so I've established that like the state, there were public schools, but I haven't really related it back to my topic sentence yet. Again, that's where like having those clear topic sentences is super helpful. So I still need to explain how that relates to economic success. This was because schools were a way to prepare the next generation for work in industrial <laughs> industries. I can't think of a better word. It's totally fine. Um, a, an educated workforce would allow the US to grow economically and compete with the other major powers of the world. Okay, so that's another piece of outside evidence. I've specifically mentioned, now if you don't know who Horace Mann is, but you do know that like public schools came about in the late 1800s, that's fine. If that's That should be specific enough, as long as, again, the key for outside evidence is not throwing out a name like Horace Mann. That's not impressive to people. What's impressive to the reader is this. Like this was because, this then led to, and really clearly linking it back to this topic sentence that you have up here. Okay, so now I've added in my other piece of outside evidence. Um, I have three minutes left. I'm gonna maybe try to evaluate a document just so that we can see one more example and I can get it in before they'd start telling me to upload. So I really wanna talk about why the heck they made a postcard of their education building. I don't know why I'm so fascinated by that. So let me go through and find document three, let me just go right after I mentioned it. You can hip a document wherever you want. Like I could awkwardly just put it down here in a conclusion, but when you're typing, it's really easy to just go back here. Um, since <laughs> this building was put on a postcard, which would likely be purchased by visitors, either Japanese people coming from from other cities or foreign visitors, it is clear that the Japanese government believed that their education system was important. Moreover, they wanted visitors, I can't type, especially visitors from other countries to think of Meiji Japan as an educated nation on par with the West. Okay, I think that's good. I think that's enough, right? I mean, I don't really have time to, to add any more, but what I'm basically saying is who's the intended audience of this postcard? Well, who buys postcards, right? I mean, tourists do. So it's kind of weird, right? Like if I'm a tourist, I'm not gonna buy a picture of the Department of Education, but clearly the people in the government thought this is like something we want visitors to like take away with them. We want them to remember like, whoa, when I think of Japan, I think of educated. And so clearly, right, that relates to my topic sentence, which is states using educational institutions to promote national pride, right? It's even international pride saying, I want foreign visitors who come when they think of the new Meiji government, I want them to think of our great education system. Um, and in some ways it's worked, right? I mean, we still kind of do that when we think about a lot of East Asian countries, we're still like, whoa, their math and science education is amazing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's my essay. Now, have I done comple complexity? Who knows? We never know, right? What they're really looking for in complexity is are you making connections? So some of the places where they might see complexity is all the places where I tied documents together. I said things like, similarly, these two documents are the same. If I'd had more time, I might have wanted to go back and talk about the fact that both Germany and Japan are really young countries and maybe like there's a key there, maybe there's something there to the fact that like they're both super young and so it makes sense that education is really important to them because they're trying to build something new. Um, that would be an example of complexity. If I'd had time to really go back and explain like 
hey, why did both of these new countries both really, really emphasize education as one of their first things? And in that case, I also can make the same connection with the United States. Why did this new nation of the United States also really want to emphasize education? It's really to compete with these other powers like China and the British. So if I've been able to make those connections throughout my essay, I think that would be a really good example of complexity. But like, I don't have time. I hope you see that it's way more strategic to try to just like hit as many of these points as possible rather than spending your try time trying to beautifully word something um, and like work towards complexity because we just don't know exactly what that is. Okay, so with that, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Hello again. Um, I just want to mention a few things. One, I'm going to be going live on this Marco Learning YouTube channel for the next few Saturdays. So I would really like for you to reach out to me through social media and let me know what you want to see next. So find me on Instagram at anti-social studies and I'm going to be posting in my stories another question of like, what do you want me to do next week? I can write another essay or I can go into more detail about certain aspects of the DBQ. Lastly, if you want to see practice DBQs like this one, I have this one and two others up on my website, uh, antisocialstudies.org. And then again, if you're really more stressed about like some specific aspects of the rubric, like you're like, I really still don't get outside evidence, please go subscribe to my YouTube channel, Antisocial Studies, because I've been putting out small videos specifically covering each part of the rubric with a lot of examples. So today I wanted to show you how I might put it all together, but on my YouTube channel, you can go and like watch a video just on HIP and how to evaluate the documents. So anyway, I hope this was helpful. I really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, join me again next Saturday where I'll be doing something else, whatever y'all tell me you wanna do. Awesome, thanks y'all.